if uh, everybody could try occupy some of this huge open half of the room here, that would be great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, we are here to discuss how to investigate terrorism and extremism, subjects which have certainly dominated my reporting life very much in the last couple of years. Um, we have um, a great panel today. On my immediate left is Axel, now I'm going to completely butcher his last name. Um, hum Homeless Joe. Homeless Joe, thank you. Okay. Um, from Swedish television. He's an investigative producer and has done a, a tremendous amount of work on ISIS, um, as well as, in fact, on um, neo Nazi extremists. Um, next, next to him is Muhammad Ali, who um, is uh, based in Nairobi is Kenyon, head of the invest investigations team for Africa Uncensored, who has done a lot of work on Al-Shabaab, the um, terrorist group um, out of Somalia. And to the right of him is Aminu Abubakar, Abubakar um, uh, of AFP, based in northern Nigeria, in Kano, who has um, really in a sense, been fully engaged um, as a journalist in covering Boko Haram. Um, we're going to start off with Aminu, and uh, hence there's a map to get you oriented as to where everything is. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so that you can see from the map, uh, my base in Kano, which is about six hours drive to Medjugorje, Borno State, uh, on the border with, uh, uh, with Chad, Cameroon, and Niger. And so the, and the other, okay, now this is a map of Borno State, where most of the Boko Haram conflict is largely concentrated. And uh, of course, the military claims that Boko Haram has, in, uh, has been defeated, almost, and is on its last leg, but uh, up to this moment, Boko Haram is almost everywhere in this uh, region, which is subdivided into three. The north, which is in purple, central, which is in yellow, and then the south, which is in uh, green. Almost all of the northern border of the purple side is Boko Haram infested, and some parts of central, and so also uh, the, uh, southern, uh, the southern. Another edge of the fringes of uh, these uh, areas is Sambisa Forest, which is maybe as uh, huge as Belgium, where Boko Haram has its now major enclave. It was like a game reserve turned into a Boko Haram enclave. And well, northern Nigeria has been a hotbed of, sect of, of so much uh, of evils, sectarian, communal, social, and political. And in the last 17 years, I've been working for AFP, covering northern Nigeria, as well as other international media outlets. I have covered several of such uh, violent and often deadly upheavals. However, Boko Haram has been quite unique in its uh, brutality, I mean, its uh, length, of, uh, its length, and as well as uh, its, its, its uh, complexity. So, as a foreign journalist uh, who relies heavily on accuracy and uh, and speed has been quite uh, a challenge covering Boko Haram uh, crisis, especially from being, uh, living in an area far away from where the conflict is largely concentrated, which is in Borno State. And so I have to rely on one of the, uh, so I employ lots of other uh, uh, strategies and also means, I mean, to be able to report the story and also dig uh, stories uh, regarding Boko Haram. And one is contacts. Of course, to me, a journalist is as good as his contacts. Without contact, good contacts, 
you can write good stories. So in the last uh, eight years, I've been covering Boko Haram. I have learned, uh, I have been able to establish, I mean, a huge network of contacts uh, from the local population, from the local uh, uh, chiefs, I mean, from the militia, from the, from the militia force uh, fighting Boko Haram, and from the security agencies, from aid agencies, from uh, emergency services, and of course, from Boko, uh, from Boko Haram which is uh, a bit uh, complicated and dangerous because uh, to me, I'm quite a book around, it's just like uh, working in a minefield, uh, which, every, uh, which every step can be, large, can be potentially lethal because they are very suspicious and paranoid. When they suspect you of uh, betrayal, you are dead. It happened to one of us in 2011, a colleague of us, of ours, a TV uh, repo uh, reporter with the state-run television station in Nigeria was killed in Medjugorje outside his home. He got some, uh, he had received uh, some, a phone call days earlier accusing him of, uh, uh, of complicity with the security agencies, which he didn't take seriously. And a few days later, bam, 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 he was dead. So really we have to, we're very being careful in dealing with Boko Haram. I would do that maybe, with, maybe during the Q&A, we'll talk about that. And the second, of course, every contact has its own motive for giving you what, uh, information. So I don't take such information on face value. I take every information I take with, I receive with some dose of suspicion to be able to fathom the motive behind that information and also to be able to, to, be able to verify, I mean, its veracity. So that's why multiple contacts are very important for, I mean, for multiple sourcing. And also the clip, of course, uh, of course I live uh, uh, far away from Medjugorje, but at, in the last eight years, it has become my second home. I go there regularly to do stories because I can't do every story remotely. I have to go there in person. And uh, of course, uh, safety, personal safety is very important uh, to a journalist, especially covering conflict, uh, in conflict, in conflict zones. So I try to rein in my anxiety and fear. I'm human. Of course, I have these emotions, so I have to try to wait to suppress them. And to me, I call them like self-deception. Uh, it's like I devise some mental strategies that helps me to keep my emotions in check. And one of them is that I convince myself, you know, I try to downplay the risks and also portray a, a project, a positive attitude. And say, okay, no, you're going to be fine. Despite the challenges, despite the risks, it's going to be fine, I'll be fine. So I convince myself mentally that it, it, it will be okay. And uh, the second one is that I try to keep a low profile while in Medjugorje because uh, you never can tell who is a spy for Boko Haram, and who is a, really a Boko Haram a fighter, because they blend with the local population. And so, except where I'm in the company of my white colleagues, where I'll have to stay in the big hotels in the city with all their uh, tight security, I find myself a very uh, modest lodging, where I feel nobody will really come and pray, who is, where is I mean to stay. It sounds absurd, but to me it works with me. I mean, it helps me really stay focused on, 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 the, on the story I'm, I'm, I'm doing. And another way is that I try to do it with every, I mean, uh, any insignia that would really give me away as a journalist in public. I only reveal my identity to my interviewees or perhaps uh, somebody from I'm seeking information because really with that can, I mean, gives me some kind of degree of protection uh, from attack or from kidnap or from whatever from, uh, from Boko Haram. And uh, to me, fear and anxiety are infectious. So while, when uh, working as a team, with reporters from AFP or fixing for others, I try to, re I mean, to conceal my anxiety and fear, even when it's real, because it can really affect the morale of others and really also affect uh, the job uh, at hand. Uh, then open mind. Well, in the last eight years, uh, we, I've had so many series of uh, very bizarre and unbelievable uh, claims and information on uh, the Boko Haram insurgency, which I just really dismissed as just, uh, I mean, as uh, senseless. But over time, with, I mean, with uh, so much concrete inf evidence, I came to have an open mind. No matter how bizarre, absurd an information is, I really give it some attention and try to dig to verify whether it is uh, right or wrong. For instance, now, 
where I learned from, even from the onset, that Boko Haram uses black magic to hypnotize its foot soldiers and also the girls they use inside bombing. I said, no, no, that was just rubbish. But over time, I had to come to, come to terms and accept that as a truth. Uh, Kevin, the challenges. There are so many challenges in covering. Oh, before that, I think, it's, sorry, there's a mix-up. The psychological preparedness. This is very important in covering conflicts, especially like Boko Haram, where I mean, sourcing and verifying information could be an uphill task. One thing I do first before I set up, I, no matter how easy the task seems, I convince myself that uh, really it could be difficult. There could be obstacles on the way. So when they pop up on the way, I don't get discouraged or, uh, uh, or taken off guard. And secondly, I, no matter how, I mean, well, no, no, no matter how difficult the task may seem, I really convince myself it's doable. Like in, 20, in, 20, in 2005, I had an interview with Muhammad Yusuf, the, the, I mean, the founder of Boko Haram. And it took three months to set up, and they didn't give up. And really, at the end, we got the interview. Well, I've got challenges. There are several challenges in dealing with Boko Haram, uh, in the Boko Haram conflict. And one of them is uh, limited uh, telecom uh, infrastructure. Because in the last uh, six years, Boko Haram, after they were chased out of uh, the Meduguri, which is the, cap which is the, the capital of the region, into uh, the countryside, they went to uh, bombing all telecom towers. So now, I mean, largely, most of like Northern Borno on the border with Cameroon and Chad is not reachable. Perhaps uh, the only, our only solace is that uh, uh, people in uh, border areas with uh, Cameroon pick signals from, uh, from Cameroon. So there is Cameroon uh, uh, phone services. And even that, even with that, in terms of during uh, like military operations, where Nigerian uh, security uh, uh, military or the, the Cameroon counterparts, they disrupt such signals. So you can send people two, three days, you can't reach your uh, uh, my contacts. And these contacts, sometimes they have to trek several kilometers. I mean, to be able to get in touch. So really, this uh, delays uh, the, I mean, my, my reports, I mean, I, I mean in, the, in the event of some, uh, uh, some attacks. And another thing is that uh, the areas where these, uh, the insurgency or the violence allegedly concentrated are still not accessible. Although Boko Haram has been chased out from these areas, uh, they, they seized and declared their caliphate, but there's still much around, and integrated tactics at uh, attacking, uh, uh, raiding villages, uh, also attacking military checkpoints, and also attacking civilian convoys under military escorts. So that makes it difficult for me to get in and then get some information because uh, really, I just can't take that risk. It's too much of a risk to take. Sorry. And <laughs> okay, another thing, lastly, maybe what I would say is that uh, the online nightmare. We now we have everybody in Nigeria is a journalist. I mean, just uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, and then they began churning out stories, information that uh, most cases misleading. And so my editor, my bureau chief, all the time keeps calling me. Oh, we learned that uh, Sheikh has been okay, is now holed up in the UN building in Medjugorje. Say what? It took me like. Uh, the whole night and the following morning to confirm that that story was not true. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Axel. Got to do some uh, fiddling around here, excuse me. To work? Yeah. Ten minutes. I'm counting myself. Um, 
So okay, I'm going to talk about ISIS and specifically a big database leak that came from their own intelligence service uh, in 2015. And this leak was named the ISIS files and I was the producer for that one hour documentary um, called The Swedish Terrorist on SVT. And the story begins like this. You don't hear this, right? No. Now this is supposed to be the volume. Audio. We need audio. Audio. It worked before. Let's see. Do we have a technician here? No. This is Julian Pierce, um, and he says, I remember the song when the terrorists started to shoot. The song was called Kiss the Devil. I'll do this. I have a solution. I remember the song when mm -hmm. the terrorists. Uh, we'll do a hack. Uh, Sorry, folks. Hang in there, it's worth it. I'll stop my 10 minutes. It's for gaining more time. And so let's do this. It's fine. Let's try it. So that will work. I remember the song when the terrorists uh, started to shoot. Uh, the name of the song is uh, Kiss the Devil. Uh, it was the beginning of the song when they came in and started shooting. Um, so this was a short clip from our investigative documentary. Um, Julian Pierce was at Bataclan that night and survived, but 130 people were killed in the streets of Paris that night. It was the worst terror attack in France since World War II, and it was a military operation, really, and ISIS was behind it. And uh, after Paris, this was the main characters uh, that took part in the attack. And after Paris, almost all of them died or got um, arrested by the cops. But this guy in the middle here, named Mohammed Belkaid, he was not in Paris. He was the commander in chief, so to speak. And he was in Belgium coordinating the whole attack. And he's in the center of our investigation. There was a lot of talk about the mystery of Mohammed Belkaid in Swedish papers after uh, he, uh, his name first came up as an important figure of the, 
of the Paris attacks. Um, he is an Algerian national, lived in Sweden for many years without any signs of extremism. And all of a sudden he left Stockholm to go to ISIS in Syria and later came back and attacked Europe. But nobody know why, so our big question in the documentary was how did he become the most notorious Swedish terrorist? And through the ISIS files, the leaked database from Syria, we got the answer. And what I'm going to go through now very fast is how we found his recruiter and how it's possible for you guys to do the same thing and to discover the networks of jihadi fighters in Europe and around the world. So the leaked database from ISIS uh, was stolen from the security service in 2015. It's a database with over 4,000 registered jihadi fighters from all over the world, but mainly Europe. Um, and it's really a gold mine for journalists. It's a detailed profile of everybody that registered uh, during 2013 and 2014 to join ISIS in Syria. So there is information there. If you look at, this is how um, one of the um, files looked like. And it was actually built in PowerPoint of some reason. And it was all written in Arabic. And there was 21 columns uh, that they had to fill in. Um, and we could see everything from the recruiters, their smugglers, the fighters' blood types, their home address, contacts in Europe, and why they wanted to join ISIS and what part of the division uh, they wanted to go in. And we got these files through a cooperation with the German public service. And um, we have shared the material with journalists in the US, in France, and in Syria. And um, after the seminar, I hope there is some more of you journalists that want to to keep on cooperating and we can share the material with you because really is ISIS works internationally, globally, and that's what we need to do as well. So we have had great success with um, cross-boarding investigations with different journalists. So if you're interested in covering this, please talk to me afterwards. So the file of Mohammed Belkaid, the Swedish um, known terrorist, in that one, we could read that he joined ISIS in Syria 2014, and he, and he registered in the border control Talabayad. And we could see his ISIS warrior name, and uh, his address in Stockholm, nationality, experiences in languages, what smuggler he had, and that he signed up to be a suicide bomber. But, so we had a really good profile of him, but the problem was when we we're looking, of course, in the field of his recruiter, it was empty. So what we did then was to track all the Swedes on the list, and there were 13 of them. And we translated all the files from Arabic into a file where we and the Germans could uh, work together. And it looked like you see here. Um, and what we did was then to try to... We took their names, we went on to to check their police records, their addresses, their Facebooks, and we built the big sociogram to see if we could find any connections to Belkaid, because he was the main target. And in the end, we found four recruiters, or four fighters, that was on the list. There was very uh, many things that pointed towards Belkaid. Um, and in the end, we could see that they had gone at the same time to Syria in the same border controls, and they lived, all of them, in the north of Stockholm. And when we investigated them and their recruiters, we found a common name. This man is called Abu Omar. He was he's 55 years old. He's a businessman from Morocco and lived in Sweden for 30 years. In uh, the beginning of the 2000s, he was called the, banker of, the Nordic banker of Al-Qaeda. And he worked with finance and infrastructure for uh, uh, sending young, many times criminal, disillusioned men from Europe and Nordic countries to first Afghanistan, Iraq, and now Syria. 
And we could find through the database that he recruited four fighters, um, all in all. And since we don't have all the time, I can't go through how exactly we found them, uh, but it wasn't all through the ISIS files. But through the ISIS files, we got his name, and we got addresses, and we got uh, certain leads that we could send later move on to. And we found him really when we started investigating the mosques, the mosques where he had been recruiting in. And we found sources in the mosques that was very, very um, angry at him because they tr he tried to take over and make the mosque more extreme. So it was really an um, a investigation that was leaning on a group that many times in Europe and Sweden are pointed out as maybe either supporter of ISIS or somebody that you can't really um, talk to. And that is a big problem because our best sources was inside the Muslim community. And also, uh, this cross-border investigation may, made us access to um, intelligence sources in the US and in England and in France, which also confirmed the connection between Belkade and Abu Omar. And the summary of what, what he did was that Abu Omar recruited Belkade in a mosque where he went daily. He uh, gave him work in his shop where he uh, first taught him the extreme uh, learnings of his ideology and then gave him the order to go to Syria, join ISIS and be a suicide bomber. So, um, let's see if I have... Um, if there's anybody interested in, in cooperating with this to go through the files of your specific country, we're always open for that. You can see the whole documentary, The Swedish Terrorist, at SVT Play. And um, I look forward to your questions. By the way, for those of you who came in late, uh, that was Axel Homeless Show, as he says, Homeless Joe, and from Swedish television. And I'm going to call on Mohammed Ali now, who's investigations, um, uh, who's an investigative producer for Africa Uncensored, based in Nairobi, and doing a lot of work on Al Shabaab. And I think that you want to show. Do you want to show? Okay, well then we need to just... I'm just stopping it. Just moving it. Okay. I'm going to open it and just pause it. Sorry. There we go. Oh. Hi, everybody. The good thing about being the last speaker, you get a lot of time. So my name is Mohamed Ali, I'm from Kenya. Uh, I work for a company by the name of African Uncensored. Uh, we started this company after feeling that the media houses that we were working for were gagging our stories. So we decided to leave and, uh, and start our own company where we can be telling the stories the way it is. Now, I've been going around the world talking about terrorism. Last year I was here, but every time I ask people to define for me who is a terrorist, no one has an answer. It is because if we get the answer, then all of us are terrorists. Reason being, one, there is the so-called terrorist. The people who kill because they have a, a certain agenda. Two, there is a government that is fighting these terrorists. This government is stepping on toes of the citizen by killing the wrong people instead of fighting with the terrorist. And the third, we, the media people, we normally don't tell the three sides of the story, the government, the terrorist, and your story in it, the three sides of the story. So we end up doing stories 
according to the government. Or let me say the issue to do with terrorists, we normally tell these stories according to the according to the to the Western Western media. And uh, I'm sorry, I can see you are the majority here. There is this perception uh, that a terrorist is an Arab, a terrorist is a Somali. You know, terrorists are always in the Middle East. This is the perception that has been created by the system. But no one of us is asking us, is asking what happened between these two people. Who was Osama bin Laden before he was a terrorist? How was he used? Who is Gaddafi? Who is uh, Robert Mugabe? What is going on? This is our duty to find out because now Libya was better with Gaddafi. It is worse. Iraq was better with Saddam. It is worse. And I'm not saying that those guys are good, but there is always an interest. It's upon the journalists to look at this interest. Now I'm going to take you back to my country, Kenya. Uh, our neighbor is Somalia. We've been suffering a lot because of uh, the attacks coming from the Al-Shabaab because uh, we decided to send our military forces to Somalia, and now we are paying the price uh, on, on behalf of the Americans. So, because our military went there to defend nothing, there's no oil, there's nothing. So we went there and fought, and now we are suffering. We did a story called Where Our Children, whereby our Kenyan government, Kenyan police, instead of fighting down terrorists, they ended up killing their own countrymen. Uh, they could take you out of your house, take you uh, deep into the forest, force you to, to, to dig up a small grave, a shallow grave, and then they'll shoot you, put your body there, cover it, and went to go away. Then the hyenas will come and maybe find your bare bodies, and then the hunters will, on the way, find these bodies. So there was a lot of young men who were missing all the time in, in Kenya, especially in Nairobi and Mombasa, they were being killed by the government in the name of fighting terrorists. So I am going to show you a small clip. Okay, start. So that is a small promo of one of the programs that we did. Uh, it is called Where Are Our Children, if you want to watch it on YouTube. And uh, uh, the police has, have been living in denial all the time, defending themselves and saying that uh, they are not behind the killings. So this time around we got an evidence and uh, we even went as far as closer to the border whereby a 55-year-old woman was killed and buried by the Kenya police uh, forces.
Now, this is the beauty. It's the beauty of the bad side of the story, whereby you guys are forced to stand there when the body is being exhumed. It's a body of a 55-year-old woman who was killed and buried. Uh, so you, you can imagine the, the body being exhumed, the pathologist working on her body and trying to find out what really happened. So in short, uh, what I'm trying to say as a journalist is that most of us, when we do certain stories regarding uh, touching on terrorism, we end up being branded as terrorist sympathizers. It has happened in UK, US, Kenya is, a, is, is always the talk of the town. Uh, it is because we, we journalists who cover these stories stand out as human rights defenders. Sometimes you cross that line of being a journalist you go to being a human rights defender because of the killings and the troubles that people are going uh, through. Uh, for, the, for the media, uh, pardon? For the, me, for the media, my humble request is that whenever that we are doing these stories, we should be very careful because a lot of information is coming out from the government, from the terrorists, and from those people who spread rumors all the time. It is always good when you're coming to a certain country, if it is Boko Haram, Nigeria, or you're coming to Kenya because of Al-Shabaab, or you're going to Iraq because of ISIS or Syria, it is always good to double check your facts, your sources, so as to get it right. Because most of the time, uh, we are just going there to tell the story. People are going there with a, 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 an already written script you know that you are being sent to Kenya or you are being sent to Syria. You just parachute very quickly. You have your own script and you want the people to say the way you want it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very big topic that we can discuss the whole day. But the day we shall get the definition of who a terrorist is, is the day everything will be okay. Thank you. Well, we, uh, we have quite a bit of time for questions, um, and uh, I'll throw open the floor to anybody who wants to start off. Do we have somebody in the audience to pass the mic around? Oh, we do. Okay. Um, let's just see, like, generally a show of hands. I see one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Um, I think what uh, it seems what works best is just to take two questions at a time um, and uh, the first one at the very back on the back row no and the woman at the back please put your hands up if you want the mic and uh, second one you One of the panelists, I think it was Mohammed, talked about um, activism in journalism. Um, in journalism. Sorry, can you please talk one, up? One of the panelists, I think it was Mohammed, talked about um, being an activist in reporting. And my question is, where do you draw the line between journalism and activism? Because we're seeing more and more this activism type of reporting and it seems it's becoming very blurry so where do you draw the line between being a journalist and being an activist while reporting thanks okay and uh, the second question i think was down here in the fourth row uh yeah exactly Thank you. Uh, my name is Jens. I'm a journalist from the Danish newspaper Berlingske. Thank you to all uh, three speakers. Um, my question is for Alex. How did you go about getting sources in the uh, Muslim uh, environments in Sweden and especially in the, mos in the mosques? Um, okay. Well, does anybody who wants to take the question about the line between Journalism and activism. I'm not sure I heard the original 
I, I don't oh I guess you did well, where do we draw the line between being a journalist and an activist? I think we draw the line by telling the truth, by standing with justice. Because uh, we are all human beings. No one is perfect. But if you see the way people are being killed, you must do what you can to make sure that these people get this information so that the killing should come to an end. So I normally say that in covering such scenarios, such cases, you end up being an activist, you end up being a human rights defender because you can see the way the generation is being wiped out. But in reality, if you stand with the truth, justice, then it will be much easier for you to do the story. When I was in school, we were taught about telling the two sides of the story, your side and my side. You are always told to be objective, that if you talk about this guy, also talk about the other guy. But I think we are past that now. We are telling the three sides of the story. Your side, my side, and then the truth. This is works, yeah? Um, so I'll move on to the next question. Um, it was very interesting, actually, because so the first, uh, the first research was quite easy in the way that we, when we had the profiles of these uh, different, um, of these four different um, fighters, ISIS uh, travelers, we um, investigated which mosques they had been going to, and then we had quite a good list in Stockholm. And then when we tried to get in contact with uh, the leaders of the mosques, they didn't really want to talk to us, uh, because they are, uh, of course, suspicious against journalists, there's been a lot of, lot of bad reporting uh, during the years, both international and in Sweden, where um, I think very, very good um, Muslim community leaders are pointed out as extremists without uh, very good research behind it. So they were skeptical, even though we are the biggest program in Sweden and have a very good um, reputation when it comes to investigative journalism. So my way of, of getting access to especially two people that was very important in the end that had been fighting this Abu Omar guy in the mosque, fighting physically and throwing him out because he was there trying to, um, to recruit. And what I did was I used my, my, my private network of um, especially uh, Muslim women that, it, that I've uh, got to know through my wife. And they were able to uh, tell the the sources, who I was, what I did before, and through that we were able to build a, a personal relationship and start talking and they could uh, confine in me and, and uh, become sources in this subject that they were so, so, so scared about because, as I said, when it comes to the Middle East, Muslims are the biggest victims for ISIS, but also when it comes to uh, Europe, they are very, very um, uh, attacked, both in the community, but also by the media and by politicians. So they have all the rights to be suspicious, I think. I just wanted to add one thing to what Axel said, having covered now uh, two years of the Paris attacks and its aftermath since I live in Paris. One of the best sources I found was um, the mosques that the in that uh, these guys used to attend and somehow dropped out of during the process of being recruited um, into ISIS networks um, and people who had known them until recently and then you know had lost touch of them touch with them somehow had a very good feel for what had happened and and who the networks were in the neighborhood anyhow so next um, can we have the next two, which I think we're both down here? Um, one and two. Okay. Actually, so let's make it three. One, two, and three. So, two and three. And we'll take, uh, we'll ask three questions and we'll answer three questions. Actually, I wanted to ask two questions in one, but. Uh, well, first question to Alex. Uh, I've been covering the ISIS files in Finland as well. 
And I would like, like to ask, what is your relationship with your secret police, Seppo? You know, in, in all of all the reporting on ISIS fighters. And I would like to ask uh, Mohammed and uh, Aminu that, do you see any chance of cooperation working on Al-Shabaab networks uh, in Europe? Or I don't know, is Boko Haram, how, how are you, how are they connected? Can we be, you know, doing any cooperation on this? Uh, yeah, I just want to know what are the challenges that you personally face. Can you speak right into the microphone? Here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I just want to know what are the personal challenges that you had to face as journalists covering uh, ter terrorism and extremism? Hi, my name is uh, Ronald. I'm from Uganda. I have two quick questions. One is for Mr. Uh, Mohammed Ali. I came in this room to sort of get clarity uh, about the subject of terrorism, but I don't want to leave more confused than I came in. This, your idea of uh, uh, telling the three sides of the story is not so clear to me. I've always thought that uh, uh, journalists are supposed to, to be neutral when doing stories. So you basically uh, look for the two sides, the protagonists and maybe those maybe you could call victims. But now you are introducing a new concept of the media itself having a side in the story. That is not so clear to me. I wish you could maybe clarify a little more. And then to Mr. Abubakar. I was just wondering, uh, in your introductory, introdu introductory remarks, you said that uh, a journalist is as good as uh, his sources, his or her sources, and I agree with you. But I was wondering, how have you maintained, uh, uh, you, you said that you've covered uh, Boko Haram for, I think, eight years. How have you maintained uh, uh, some sort of neutrality, or how have you gained confidence of the two sides, considering that this is uh, a very div divisive, uh, 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 war going on in Nigeria. I mean, the side of Boko Haram and uh, the government, how have you maintained uh, neutrality throughout this conflict? Thanks. Uh, I think uh, in my powers as, uh, as moderator, I think we might, if, if, if you don't mind, just skip over the personal challenges question given time, since both Aminu and Mohammed spoke, um, spoke about this, unless one of you has something to add to it. But um, uh, Aminu, maybe I can just start off um, with you, talking about the links between Boko Haram and Europe. Are there any? Should we be looking for them? Um, because very little has been reported about uh, about that at all? It's very likely. Uh, Boko Haram is more likely to have uh, contacts with uh, IS uh, and Al-Shabaab because uh, in 2009, after the crackdown on the group uh, following the Maiden uh, insurrection in Maiduguri, some of them really slipped out of the country and headed to Afghanistan and also to Somalia. And now we know one of the de facto leaders of uh, the splinter, Boko Haram splinter, I mean the Iswab, uh, Maman Noor, really uh, was in Somalia for quite some time before he moved to uh, uh, Burkina Faso and then, then moving back to Nigeria I mean, in the last two years. So, and perhaps, in the, and the fear is that now with uh, ISIS uh, facing sort of defeat in Syria and Iraq, they are likely to focus attention back to. Sahel and North Africa. And now with Boko Haram, at least one, one of the factions uh, aligned uh, with ISIS, I mean, following the, the allegiance, uh, they are quite likely to be a more active cell of, uh, I, uh, of, uh, of IS. And perhaps that could also maybe lead to links with Europe. But, no, but I don't think uh, Boko Haram will, will, will directly have links with their counterparts in Europe but perhaps maybe through IS, yes, maybe. Um, Axel, could you quickly address this uh, subject of your relation, the relationship um, that you have um, 
I think it's uh, much more general than just the Swedish police because I think this is the one of the most difficult questions as a journalist when it comes to terrorism because uh, the intelligence sources, the intelligence community is uh, not to be trusted in many ways because they have all, always their own agenda. And we've seen numerous occasions in the, la in the war against terrorism where uh, intelligence sources have uh, gave the wrong information and been lying. And even if you have two or three or four intelligence sources, they can be uh, fooling you around. So I think what we did in this project, it was very important to have a, a relationship with the intelligence police. And, but what we used them for was to verify material uh, and to get a, a different perspective on some of the questions, but never use them as uh, the only sources for the project. And um, I think when it came to, when it comes to um, Islamic terrorism, they want to work with journalists many times. So you also have to be, uh, keep your integrity, but of course use them when, uh, when they have good information, but never trust them only. I think that's a very good segue to ask uh, Mohammed to address the question of neutrality when we talk about terrorism, a word that itself is very, very loaded. Well, uh, let me start with a question. She was asking the networking of Al-Shabaab with Europe. Uh, as we know, Al-Shabaab works hand in hand with Al-Qaeda. Uh, Osama bin Laden once named a guy by the name of Fazul who was killed as the uh, right hand man of Al Qaeda in uh, in Africa, so there is a connection with with Al Qaeda. But again, there must be somebody who is funding these people in terms of weaponry and money. So it's up to you to find from that end because the money is coming from that end. Uh, the other question that my neighbor here from Uganda asked was the issue to do with the new neutrality. And uh, you are saying that the three sides of my story, uh, I mean, won't work. You need more explanation. Now, this is how I'm going to explain to you. An attack happens in America. A man takes a rifle, goes to a school, kills more than 30 students. What do we call him? A lone ranger, or a man with a gun, or we call him he had mental illness, right? Somebody takes a, a plane, crashes it somewhere. Remember the German scenario where a pilot crash land people and all the people who were on board died. What do we call him? He always has a name that he had a mental problem, he was stressed. Now, another person in the Middle East takes the same gun, kills 30 students. What do we call him? Terrorist. So this is where I want you to draw the line and tell the three sides of the story. Because if a black man in America does something bad, kills people, we call him a black man doing something. If somebody else does the same thing in another country, he is called a terrorist. That is why when I started this conversation, I asked you guys for the definition of who exactly a terrorist is. The day we will know a terrorist, then we will all agree that there is a problem somewhere and we are going to fix it this way. So it's not about saying that, you know, if you do it like this, it's a perception that has been created. It has been there for many, many years that if certain leaders in this world says something, we all agree to it even before investigations. For example, here in South Africa, Nelson Mandela was labeled as a terrorist. He was in the black books, but now he's a great man, he's a hero. Everybody is celebrating his achievement. But in 1994, he was in a black book in America as a terrorist, simply because he was fighting for the rights of his people. So we need as a journalist to differentiate, and that is why I have a problem with the journalists who are flying in to different countries, telling the stories very quickly, without double checking. You come to Somalia, 
you tell the people that this is the most dangerous place in the world. But people are living. People are eating. They are sleeping. Life goes on. There is some attacks. But you don't want to tell us who is this person giving them weaponry. Because there is somebody who has an interest in making sure that this war keeps on going on. Who is this person? What does he want? We always talk about terrorism, but we don't want to tell the real story behind the terrorism itself. And that is where we get it wrong all the time. People are fighting for scoop. People want to hit the headlines. You want to be seen on TV as the toughest journalist covering Somalia, covering Syria. And nowadays, people are very smart because once you come to their country, they want money. So they will tell you, give us money, we'll tell you the truth. You end up giving out money and they'll tell you a fake story. And you'll go with that fake story on air. It happened to a CNN lady in Kenya. She was given a fake story to an extent that she was recalled from Kenya. Now I can see her in Libya. I hope it's not a fake story too. <laughs> All right, let's take the uh, next few hands. One, two, three. Uh, okay, uh, sorry, if we can start down here and then the two way up there. Thank you. Uh, it is not a secret that uh, terror organizations will depend on media highlights to thrive. Uh, so my question is, uh, sometimes we experience a lot of these attacks but uh, as media, we go back to these stories and highlight and dig into these stories, and sometimes even interfering with national security. And my question uh, would be, is, uh, is it perhaps time that uh, media, the, the, the discussions around media controls actually kick off? And uh, will that again mean gagging the media? It's a tricky uh, balancing test actually, but I would want to hear that question from uh, the panelists. You, you have to excuse me for my English, but I didn't really... Uh, can you the, the question is, is it time for the media to have some kind of balance? Is that right? Yes, in terms of... Uh, in terms uh, of propaganda and, and being used as a... Uh, sort of, but actually going back to the stories, because there are times... Uh, let me give an experience of Kenya, where I come from. At times, I come from the coastal part of Kenya, where these attacks actually concentrated more on that particular area. But at times there is a lull, a huge uh, uh, time actually goes without seeing any of these attacks. But there is a way in which media, uh, we go back to these stories to try and reignite uh, these discussions again. And most of the time, again, it interferes with national intelligence uh, security issues. So I wanted to hear uh, just from the panelists to talk to us about how is it then in terms of uh, discussing around this subject. Is it time to discuss media controls around reporting terrorism? And, or will it uh, amount to gagging the media? Okay, um, and two questions at the very, very, very top of the top left up there. Hi, uh, my name is Muhyiddin. Uh, this question goes to Muhammad Ali. And by the way, thank you for the good job you're doing back in Kenya. Uh, in Kenya, when Al-Shabaab is reported, it's often linked to the Somali identity. If and when those who behind these attackers were necessarily not Somalis, and it reached to that level where someone sees a Somali, he will it immediately ask you about Al-Shabaab, or he will immediately accuse you being a member of Al-Shabaab. And th that perception was mainly created by the media uh, because of the way they talk about Al-Shabaab, which we see as a regional or an international network of, of terrorists, rather than being an organization uh, uh, from a particular community. So my question is, how could the, me the media, in particularly those in Kenya, that w that where you're from, can avoid creating these kind of perceptions that put risk and threats the lives and the, uh, of, of, of a certain community uh, in these kind of situations? Because now 
Pina Somali in Kenya is becoming a very, a problem, a problem, a very problem, a big problem to, to those people, to those particular communities. And necessarily they are not, it's not only a Somali, members of Somali communities and members from other communities in Kenya are part of Al-Shabaab. So how, what do we do? How, how should journalists avoid labeling a particular community as sympathizers or as members of a terrorist organization? Uh, sorry, it's a man right behind. Thank you for a nice presentation. I have just a quick question about the role of uh, social media in both extremism and, uh, and uh, recruitment of uh, jihadists in the uh, European continent or USA. Um, the question of media controls is a time to control. Uh, I, I, if I understood the question correctly, forgive me if I'm wrong, that maybe we should be sort of limiting ourselves or shall I say censoring ourselves um, in covering terrorism. Personally, I would not uh, like, like that idea. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? I think it's, it's, I don't know the, the press system in, in Kenya, uh, but I think it's very, very important that you have uh, um, free media and all of that, and, and there is a wave of regulations all over the world now against media that I think it's very important to, to stop. But with that said, uh, there is a lot of that uh, stories when it comes to terrorism that have been uh, reported where very badly. And I think the most important thing in that perspective is to have some kind of accountability uh, towards the publishers, to have a system where you actually have to admit that you were wrong and to publish that um, in your paper where you published the original story and also in the end be able to get sentenced to, uh, to uh, punishment if you are uh, done uh, published histories that were fake or, or wrong. Uh, but I think that's the way to go forward, not to regulating the media itself. Um, yeah. I, I think that's uh, probably a good way just to segue into the question of social media, which actually we didn't touch on at all. Um, I'm not sure which of our panelists, all of us obviously are covering issues of terrorism where you know we're constantly monitoring various social media, Facebook pages of ISIS, um, Twitter feeds, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of group, groups on Telegram. Um, so, Aminu, would you like to tackle that at, at all in terms of Boko Haram? Yeah, I think, uh, fortunately, it has Boko Haram. Uh, their social media atmosphere is quite restricted, mostly to uh, members of the group, of course, they have WhatsApp, Twitter, mostly they're mostly on WhatsApp and Twitter as well. But uh, really, it's a, a closed group. It just meant not to, it isn't meant, I mean, for recruiting, but for sharing information and also strengthening the bond between them. And uh, really, but uh, I only came to know of uh, these platforms when uh, a colleague of mine, a very close friend of mine, who happened to be a child friend of one of the Boko Haram uh, 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 maybe leaders uh, in, uh, in the Northeast. Because these uh, chaps were part of the society before they became what they became. So they had contact with uh, people everywhere. I mean, they are the friends of someone, uh, they were the, like somebody's uh, um, nephews, somebody's uh, uh, students. So they had this kind of contacts and particularly among, among journalists. I mean, the, some of them, I mean, were child friends to some of us. So that was how, in most cases, they got in touch, I mean, with some of the, the propaganda uh, videos. So, I mean, luckily for that uh, particular friend who happens to work for also, I mean, a foreign uh, radio station, now was included in the WhatsApp group. And from there, we, I do get some kind of feedback or some feed from, I mean, the kind of uh, exchanges between them. So really in Nigeria, likely for now, honestly, we don't have that kind of online, online uh, recruitment 
but they necessarily they have it uh, to share information among themselves and also to keep uh, the bond of uh, terrorism among themselves. I can just add um, something short to the social media question because I think it's, it's uh, a good way to also um, also expand the definition of terrorism that we're talking about here or the definition of groups because now we're talking a lot about Muslim extremism and, and but when it comes to social media, ISIS and the neo-Nazis or the new alt-left or the violent groups of the right really have boomed through the social media. They are, they are very good at it uh, and you can see a, mu a lot of uh, similarities between the, um, the um, ISIS propaganda and the, the right-wing propaganda and it's really, really something that I think it's discussing now in Facebook communities and Twitter um, um, how this can be uh, dealt with because um, there's a lot of fake news, propaganda, recruiting that goes through these channels. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Um, I, I'm going to just see how many more folks still want to um, ask questions. And uh, if you could keep your questions brief, if we can get more answers in. Uh, sorry, the microphone, the microphone man. Um, sorry, Mohammed, literally from the microphone. Uh, sorry, we were going to just address, in really in one minute, um, the question of the Somali labeling Somalis uh, Shabab as being a Somali phenomenon. Well, I think what you yeah, it's all about profiling, and I'm sorry about that because it's not only the Somalis; it's happening all over the the world nowadays. Uh, Profiling is a common thing in, in, in Kenya. If you are a Somali, they believe that you are from Somalia and you are an Al-Shabaab, you've come to attack Kenyans. So uh, there is a documentary that we did about that. It's called Call the Executioner. Uh, I also did one with Al Jazeera. It's called Killing Kenya. You can watch it on YouTube. The profiling also happens in America. After 9-11, a lot of people were told to leave the country. Trump did the same during the campaign, saying that some people should leave the country. Uh, about the issue of social media, yes, the terrorist organizations are using it big time to lure people into it, to make young men and women join, join them. In our place in Kenya, the Al-Shabaab are using it a lot. They are even going to the war zone, fighting the government in Somalia and fighting the Amazon military. And they, they film it, they have journalists within themselves. They have a cameraman, they have a reporter, and they broadcast these stories. When the government denies that it is Al-Shabaab, uh, Al-Shabaab will say it is us, and they will do a documentary and show to the world that it is indeed them who did that. So they are using this social media platform to get more followers. Hi, I would like to leave a comment on the media control that you were asking about. Um, there are certain ways that media can self-regulate itself when it's reporting terror attacks, for example. And one thing is the, if you are going to publish the name and the picture of the person who did it, because they are after fame. The target is as much the media or even more than the actual victims of the attack. So it's a media war. And we can report as much as we want, of course, in detail about what has happened, but we could sometimes think, is it, is it necessary to spread the pictures of the attackers the names, what, what value do they have? Of course, then the question of who is a terrorist, we can also think about the language. You know, if in Israel there's a suicide bomber, in Iraq there's an insurgent, but in London there's a terrorist. And this is from BBC guidelines that they are asking their journalists to avoid the word terrorist. And of course, there's the volume. How much um, volume do we give to each terror attack? You know, that's what we can regulate definitely. How many other important issues there are happening in the world? We can think of use of propaganda. Are we using their material as such? Because this is exactly what they want us to do, you know? And of course, we can, we can also think how, how, how much religious, how much religion we add to our reporting, how much is actually political or something else. So this is just certain aspects of responsibility. 
All good points. Um, I see on my clock we have three more minutes and we have one more hand up. I think that's going to have to be the last, I'm afraid. Mine is also a comment just to add to the conversation of terrorism. And uh, I totally feel my brother from Somali. And uh, uh, there's a lot of profiling that's going on, especially in Kenya and in East Africa. Right now, the, the profiling has peeled over to even Uganda. Uh, and uh, also in some places, Tanzania. And it's not... Uh, it's up to us, I think it's up to us as journalists to try and change this narrative and just look at the real issue that is going on. Who is, and I like the fact that Moha said that we need to start even looking at angles. Uh, let's change the narrative to knowing who is the one who is funding this thing, who is fueling the fights, uh, who is fueling um, uh, the weaponry that these people have who is giving them muscles, if we start looking at that narrative, then we'll start changing and understanding, and we'll start understanding what it means. Uh, being a terrorist and also being a victim, and also this profiling that has been going on for long. I think, Axel, you had a last um, comment to make, and also Aminu. Yes, I just wanted to add, because I think we really want have to address this in a discussion about journalism and, and terrorism, the, the question that we're in front here about personal challenges. I think we have to address the security problem, which is, from my perspective at least, the, the, the worst part of reporting on terrorism and extremism, the, the consequences for uh, the family and, and the kids and uh, your way of life, really. And I think that's, that's one of the most important things that you have to know when you get into these topics that it really uh, changes your life. Hidden identity, uh, you have to move sometimes, you have to, uh, you get death threats, and these groups really, really sometimes uh, try to get at you as a journalist. So that is, for most of us, I think the biggest personal challenge. So about, about, about leadership. Associate. Really, of course, uh, like uh, you know, in our case AFP, we do get lots of uh, vocal and videos, and uh, of course, uh, maybe they take quite some uh, quite gruesome uh, with decapitation and all these kind of gruesome killings. Of course, we can use these graphic images, but of course, we do take parts of uh, the messages because in a situation where the government is denying that uh, Boko Haram is still uh, potent and they can still attack and kill and maim. Of course, I have no option but to prove that otherwise. And with these uh, evidences, I don't think we can just uh, put on another carpet and just uh, pretend that everything is fine. We're doing our job while the government is trying to hide the reality from the public and really have the, uh, the, I mean, the, the burden of responsibility to tell the people what's really happening. And that's what we are doing. Um, it, that comes to the end of our of our panel. I really want to thank all three of the panelists.